Well, good day viewers. Today we have a 2016 Chevy Colorado. It's got the uh, 3.6 liter V6 in it, I believe. It's here because the check engine light's on. And he reported that the other day he was driving it and it, the check engine light was flashing and it had reduced power. I'm not sure if there was a message on the dash that said reduced power. So the first thing to do is to connect the scan tool to it and scan it for codes. So I've got a record on this vehicle. We've scanned it before, so I've loaded that vehicle service record. And I've got a clean battery charger connected to it, set at 13.6 volts. Key on, engine off. We're going to do a network code scan as soon as it IDs. See if it'll pull the mileage out of the ECM. 207,000 kilometers. Okay. Let's do a code scan. And it's a pre-scan. I'm expecting to see some misfire codes. As I suspected, random misfire. And then the ABS sets a code against the engine control module for invalid data due to the misfire. So this U0401 is kind of a secondary code. I don't agree with that logic setting a network type code because of a fault in the PCM that seems flawed to me in my opinion but nevertheless hood jar circuit short to battery front video display printed circuit board temperature review camera control module power circuit radio lost communication with HVAC and valid data received from transfer case control modules got a U0401 as well on the OBD2 side, it shows the misfires on cylinder 3. I wonder if he's changed the plugs in this thing. 200K, it's time if it hasn't had them changed. Uh, let's... Got a record of this information. Let's go into the engine. And into data display, as soon as it loads here. And misfire data and see... It's important you not clear the codes because you would erase this misfire data, misfire history. And misfire cylinder 3, 15,965. Now when I drove it in this morning, it wasn't really running bad. It seemed smooth. So we have to determine what side cylinder number 3 is on. I'm going to fire it up and see if there's any current misfires. So right now, running on cylinders, or on uh, current misfires, there are none. So here's 246-000 and 135-000. Let's have a look at uh, freeze frame data for that code. See if we can tell what was happening at the time. Uh, codes menu, freeze frame. See if we can get an idea what kind of engine conditions were present at the time. Well, I didn't notice that U code for lost communication with the fuel pump control module. I didn't notice that in the ECM. Distance since last failure. Ignition cycles without a misfire 9. Without a malfunction. Warm up since DTC is cleared. Let's see, short-term fuel trim on bank one and short-term fuel trim on bank two. So the fuel trims were in normal ranges. There's short-term on both banks, zero and minus three, and long-term on both banks, minus five and zero. Those were reasonable. And let's see, what was the vehicle speed and the engine the engine had been running for 16 minutes fuel rail pressure was at 1392 vehicle speed was 47 kilometers an hour so where's coolant temperature
air temperature was 2 Celsius, so coolant temperature must be on this side, 88 Celsius. So it was not quite up to temperature, running for 16 minutes, light load. So why was it misfiring? Fuel trims are in normal ranges, so it's not due to a skewed O2 sensor. Maybe it's just time for spark plugs in this thing. So before we pull the plug out of this thing, I'm going to have, I have just checked to see which cylinder is number three. So number three is the middle cylinder on the passenger side. It's one, three, five down the passenger side, two, four, six. And the firing order is one, two, three, four, five, six, which is an easy number one to remember. We're also going to check for TSBs on this problem. Well, there is a TSB on uh, diagnosing misfire or malfunction indicator light illuminated P0300 or 1 through 6. And it has to do with uh, fuel injectors, electrical issue, or loss of cylinder compression. And they're suggesting a relative compression test. But a compression problem wouldn't typically go away unless it was a a DOD lifter collapsing or something like that and now it's no longer collapsed. I'm not sure if this 3.6 has DOD or displacement on demand but they're suggesting the use of a picoscope or equivalent to do a relative compression test. I would consider that if it was actually uh, misfiring right now and it's not. You know there's a, a different examples of relative compression test. So I think we're just going to pull the plug out of cylinder number three and have a look at it. I have uh, had issues with carbon deposits on the intake valves because this is GDI and the injectors no longer spray on the intake valves. So carbon deposits on the intake valves could cause uh, random misfires or localized misfires if the valve doesn't seal properly. Well, we'll pull the plug out and have a look. So to get access to the plugs, which are down there under the coils, we need to take this air induction system off. Uh, there are, I believe, four T30 bolts. One here, one through here, and two at the back. Now, one of these is missing, and one of them has been replaced with a bolt with a uh, eight mil head. And then down underneath here, you can see that uh, right in the center of the screen, the screw clamp to the throttle body. So you have to undo that screw clamp as well and uh, you'll need a long screwdriver for that. I've taken the air cleaner lid off, disconnected the mass airflow sensor, and of course this uh, PCV fresh air hose, just press this release down and, and wiggle it out. So we see a little rodent activity underneath here. They look like they've uh, found this to be a warm spot to nest but uh, no signs of rodents and no signs of chewed wires yet anyways. So here you can see the three coils on the driver's side and the three coils on the passenger side are looks to be underneath the intake manifold panel. That's just wonderful. Well, if we got to pull the intake off to do the spark plugs, I can guarantee they've never been done before. So I thought I could sneak that coil out of there. There's four coils you could remove. This one here at the back you could get out. The three on the driver's side you could get out. But this one here hits the intake manifold. When you try to pull it up, you can pull it up like a quarter of an inch. This one, I took the purge solenoid out of the way, but it's still not gonna come up. So the intake plenum has to be removed. Uh, it doesn't look that bad. There's a bunch of clips on it and looks like two, four, six, eight bolts across the top. but And the gasket's likely reusable down here, but I think it would be wise to have a new gasket. I'll see if, if it's available. And if we're gonna pull the intake off, upper plenum off, we'll have to have a closer look at the intake valves and maybe we'll end up cleaning those as well. So to remove this intake, you have to pop, pop off some of these plastic clips, the retaining lines, the vacuum line here. And I can tell this has never been apart before because nine times out of 10, these, these plastic clips break and they're not broken. And disconnect the throttle body, remove this uh, vent hose here. I'm not sure what that is, but it's a vacuum line. No, it's a vacuum line to the brake booster. That's right. 
you have to turn it 90 degrees be gentle on it you have to turn it 90 degrees and then it just pulls out take this other vacuum hose off on the side here disconnect the map sensor blow all the dirt off the top of the engine I'm gonna blow some more here and I've got gaskets coming and spark plugs coming for this thing so I've got all the fasteners out and there's one little 10 mil bolt back here and there's a shield a steel shield that has to be removed the manifold lifts, but it won't come out. Uh, in the service literature, it mentions a, a noise shield back here. I guess the high pressure pump is on the back here. And there's this freaking steel shield that goes across the back of the intake manifold and bolts to the engine block down there. Man, they certainly didn't engineer this to work on it. This is what happened when a mechanic sleeps with an engineer's wife. See, this service literature shows that shield. I've got one little 6 mil bolt out in the back corner here. So this one's a little different, but this service information is for 2.83, 3.2, or 3.6. So some slight variations. Remove the engine rear noise shield bolt 1. Remove the engine rear noise shield. Yeah, that's easy to do with the engine sitting on the floor. Oh well, we'll have a look. So I see one fastener way down there. I'm getting it with a 10 mil quarter inch drive flex socket. I'm wondering if I can just leave that bracket in there and lift it up enough. It seems pretty rigid. Maybe there's another fastener on the other side that you can't see. So there are two little 6 mil bolts between the back of the intake manifold, one here and one here with 10 mil heads that go to that shield. I did not remove that bolt down there at the bottom. I just loosened it off and tipped that shield back. There's no way you're getting that shield out of there. Um, use an elastic band to hold these two so as I was saying, there's little six mil bolts at the back of the intake here, and I put an elastic band between these two bolts. They don't come out. Uh, this one will sneak out of there, but it wouldn't hurt when you're putting it back in to put all three of these back in and use an elastic band to hold them up so that they don't uh, interfere. So let's have a look inside the intake ports. So looking at the intake valves with my poroscope here, you can see there's considerable amount of carbon deposits on on the valves that's number two this is number four uh, number three the cylinder with the counted misfires I can't get the camera to focus on that valve very well there it is there's one so we're going to walnut shell blast the intake ports, replace the spark plugs, move number three coil to one of the accessible ones so in case it fails I can change it without having to pull the plenum off again and uh, see what happens. So I removed that sound insulation and you can see there's rodent activity under the injectors here. I already vacuumed some of it out. This was all full. I'm going to have to look in there with a borescope and see if there's any evidence chewing on the injector wires. So I decided to pull the plug out of number three just to have a look at it. Well, there's your problem, lady. I think this thing is consuming a little oil in that cylinder. Well, we're not rebuilding the engine, but we're going to put a set of plugs in it and move that coil, like I suggested, to probably the number five position because it can be replaced without pulling the plenum off. And uh, clean the intake ports. So there's all the spark plugs out, and you can see this is number this is number one, three, five. So number five cylinder is carbon fault as well, and two, four, six are pristine. So it's consuming a little bit of oil, but again, this has got over 200,000 kilometers, and these are the original plugs. So here's my procedure for 
walnut shell blasting, I have these fittings which are close to fitting the intake port and the vacuum cleaner. Harbor Freight uh, walnut shell blaster or sand blaster with walnut shells in it. Modified tip on the end of the sand blaster. These things, the ball valves fail after the media goes through and for a while this one's leaking. And uh, I've cleaned this one a little bit. You gotta make sure the intake valves are closed so you can actually see that it's starting to clean up. And the reason for walnut shells is because if there's any debris left over afterwards, it's not uh, detrimental to the engine or as detrimental as silica sand would be or anything else. So, we'll continue. So I got one more port to do. It's on number six. And you can see the edge of the intake valve opening there and I'm turning the motor over now. So you can actually see the valve closing. But then I put air pressure in the intake port and make sure it seals. Okay, that should be good. Look at one of the ports that I've done. There's the intake valve. It's not showing up very good on the camera. Looks pretty clean. A little couple spots on there, but that's not going to hurt anything. One more to do. So we're reassembling. I like to put a little bit of Never Seize on the end of the spark plug. That's just my personal opinion. Torque on the spark plugs is 18 foot pounds. Same with the intake manifold bolts, 18 foot pounds. I'm not sure what the coil bracket bolts or the coil retaining bolts are, but they're just hand tight with a quarter inch drive. So there's the engine prepped with the new intake gasket. I did look at the wires under there and I don't see any chewed wires going to the injectors. As I said, put these three bolts in. This one actually goes in underneath the uh, firewall there. But put a, a elastic band to hold them like that so that they're not sticking down the bottom. That way you can drop it in without the bolts interfering with anything. Let that heat shield tilt backwards a bit. So there it is back together and running again. Stumbled a little bit on uh, startup, but uh, smooth, smooth now. I'm going to clear the codes out of the computer and then take it for a road test. I did change the oil and filter. I have to reset the oil life monitor. I'm going to do an all system code clear. That should get rid of the codes in the ABS and transfer case modules as well. Uh, GM does allow you to do this key on engine running. That was fairly quick. 18 modules, codes cleared. Data. And let's see. Misfire data. Clearing the code should erase the misfire history. Yeah, misfire history is now gone. That's why it's so important to look at this before you clear codes. If you needed to, of course. And uh, we'll take it for a road test. I'm sure it's going to be okay. Running nice and smooth now. Thanks for watching.